confidence that you need today as you face a difficult job market as you face a difficult set of circumstances it is very easy to give up it is very easy to blame your circumstances it is very easy to blame your teachers to blame your parents to blame your environment to blame all the world for your problems but it takes courage to pick up the pieces and to put it together again and learn to walk and then to run again that is courage and that is what i would like to bless you with because you will need a lot of courage and as you become bigger as you become more senior as you hopefully some of you will occupy the corner office of whichever organization you choose to work in if you don't start your own business in which case you will be in the corner office from day one you will appreciate people with courage you will have enough people in this world who will be chaplusies who will keep telling you that you are the greatest man on this planet i have seen that many times and i know that all this is transitory jab tak gaddi hai tab tak you have all the respect in the world everybody around you thinks you are a hero everybody around you thinks you are the greatest man that has happened the day you vanish everything vanishes so you remember this simple message in your life that khali hath aaye ho khali hath jaoge that is the reality of our life how were big how were rich how were famous and how were indomitable we think we are so what will keep us together as a human being is courage what we will appreciate of each other is courage what we will appreciate from society are courageous people courageous acts courageous ways of doing things and people who are capable of standing up and saying what they think is right but they say this politely they say this decently today you are surrounded by rhetoric that is shrill today is a society where words are being spewed out without any consideration for whether they are respectful whether they are dignified or whether they hurt the soul and they hurt people who are going to hear it unfortunately that is a sign of our times but then you don't need to behave that way you don't need to be like that there is in my leadership lesson a statement that i believe holds true that nice people that nice guys that nice girls also win you don't have to be nasty you don't have to be uncivil you don't have to be arrogant you don't have to be anything less than humble and you can still win this race called life so have the courage my young friends to pursue life to the full and to take the problems in the chin when it comes and hits you take it on the chin receive it understand it get up and walk again because it is important in life not that you fall but that you get up and walk again that is what nelson mandela said and that's what i hope each one of us does in our life next slide please concentration now i know that you are a multitasking generation your generation is a generation that can whatsapp that can uh, that can uh, uh, instagram that can facebook that can email that can spotify uh, that can talk that can eat that can listen that can do everything at the same time aap sab log maharati ho aap sab log are people with numerous characteristics my generation and people like me uh, have not been like that unfortunately i can do only one thing at a time and if i do that well i'm very happy more often than not i struggle uh, with with technology not because i don't like it but because i don't understand it but one thing in life you will learn is unless you concentrate you will never excel multitasking is inefficient multitasking is costly multitasking is distracting multitasking does not help you become a perfect or a person wedded to excellence multitasking makes you a scatterbrain because in your careers as you build up your reputations you have to focus on one thing single mindedly and see it through so if you are starting your life as a salesman 
excel in the job of sales excel in the nuance of sales be the best salesman that there is for the company ever in their career or ever in their history be the best that you can in what you do today because then tomorrow will beckon you but if you are less than good less than outstanding in what you are doing today then nobody is really going to be interested in your tomorrow so concentrate concentrate and when you concentrate and you concentrate on those things that you are genuinely passionate about you will do well passion means putting that extra dollop of energy into a task that looks mundane and that looks small but if you put in that extra bit of passion and that extra bit of concentration you will excel and when you excel people will take note and when people make take note opportunities open up and opportunities will start to knock at your at your door because you're capable of doing it so concentrate my young friends so that you are able to build step by step year by year decade by decade next slide please this is something that is always we think that being creative means that you have to be either in a advertising profession or you have to be in a in a in a in a in a, in a, in a creative arts or you have to be a painter or you have to be a musician creativity is not that creativity is a muscle if you don't use it you will lose it this is the beauty about creativity every job that you do you can be creative and not all of us will land up with jobs to begin with that is going to be intensely creative i started my career as a sales trainer in those days almost 35 40 years ago my job job was to sell actually Uh, a product of of uh, hindustan liver then which unfortunately doesn't have now called dalda vanaspati dalda vanaspati was sold in tins uh, it was before the plastic era so these tins used to be stacked up in shops in jodhpur and my job as a salesman was to go and call on the shops to make the sale and to do the merchandising and the merchandising meant that you have to take every tin of dalda and you have to clean it because the belief in the company and rightly so was that a dirty tin will not attract a customer and the shopkeeper did not have the time to clean the tin so i took it upon myself that i will be the best cleaner of tins that there is and my supervisor also took notice of it and he kept telling at meetings that suresh is the best cleaner of tins and dalda tins jitni achhi tarah se ye safai karta hai aur koi ladka nahi karta that was my way of putting in my stamp of excellence now you may think that how did a person cleaning dalda tins go on to be the chairman of a company so that's how you get to be a chairman of a company because you think that no job is too small that no job is less than my capability no job is less than my haysiyat no job is less than what i need to do because unless you know to do critical jobs in your company you can never head the company you will never understand what it takes to work in 45 degrees shade in a difficult dusty sandstorm in a city called jodhpur where you don't even get to drink any water for a few hours you have done it and then you realize as a leader afterwards that this is what it takes for my people to get the job done you become more empathetic you become more understanding and you also become more creative because you know then what you need to do to improve the circumstances of your people at this point in time so be creative my friends don't ever take a job as not creative every job is creative every job can have your personal mark of excellence provided you want to give the personal mark of excellence if you don't give the personal mark of excellence it will be just another job and the way to keep interest in a job is also to put your personal creativity otherwise you will always struggle because you will be waiting for the perfectly creative job and that job will never come your way so learn to take every job and put in an element of creativity into it it will keep your interest going it will enhance your performance and also it will make you stand out amongst the crowd of people who are doing the job next slide please 
this is probably one of the things that is the worst issue to have in your life constraints and not that constraints are some things that we don't have in our lives but 80% of all obstacles to success come from the word constraint i cannot lose weight because i'm fond of jalebis i cannot get up early because i sleep late i cannot learn good music because i've got a bad throat i cannot be a good sports person because i don't want to exercise i don't want to do this because something else is happening we always put constraints to the way in which we define our lives so whether we are men or whether we are women unfortunately in india for women you also add one more constraint which is societal constraints what is it that a woman should be doing or not be doing i think these are these are constraints that we set upon ourselves unless you free yourself from constraints unless you free yourself from the boundaries that are artificially drawn in your head you will never be able to achieve the excellence that you want to achieve so it doesn't mean that all of us have to be like usain bolt and be the fastest man on the planet and that requires a training discipline dedication and the right kind of genes no doubt about it but that i want to keep fit that i want to be a good uh, sports person that i want to be a good artist that i want to be a, 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 a illiterate person that i want to learn that i want to achieve good things in life that i want to do a lot of good for people all these are possible if you shed some of the constraints that you get defined by so don't constrain yourself with constraints understand your limitations but the word is limitations not constraint because if you take out constraints from your dictionary you will be a much better more fulfilled and a happier human being because you will not hurt your conscience saying i could have done this kaash mein ye sochta to main karta you're all young you're all in your 20s this is the time for you to try this is the time for you to stretch 30 years from now 40 years from now ab pachtai hot kya jab chidiya chup gayi khet no point in saying then that i wish i had done this uh, 20 years ago time has gone the period has gone and the show has gone and the and the and the scenery has changed so don't constrain yourself next slide please it has always been said that as a leader you are supposed to be a tough leader you are supposed to be a difficult leader you are supposed to be a leader who does not compromise but that does not mean my young friends that you should not be compassionate i think the dalai lama said this beautifully the dalai lama once said that compassion is the emotion that is the most abundant and yet it is the least used and i have always believed that a good leader needs to have compassion i have always believed that having compassion is being like a coconut tough on issues but with a heart don't compromise on the issues don't compromise on the things that make you stand out don't compromise on the things that are important to you but when somebody is in difficulty reach out i have in all my years never missed a target i hate missing targets i hate missing objectives i pursue myself i push myself and i also try and inspire my people to achieve the goals that have been set but when somebody is in trouble when somebody is in difficult times my heart melts and i do what is right for the human remember one thing and this is what the famous ceo of a company called honeywell mr larry bossidy said many decades ago you will never be remembered for the profits you made you will be never be remembered for the growth you delivered but you will be never forgotten for the way you made the other person feel and i think this is something that we forget in our life we believe that to be a leader you have to be tough you have to be uncompromising you have to look stern uh, you cannot look human 
you cannot be humble you cannot be vulnerable uh, you cannot show emotions nonsense utter rubbish utter rubbish because remember your life as a human is far more important than the different avatars that you put on to it you could be chairman you could be president you could be vice president you could be general manager you could be next to god but you are only next to god you are still a human being and to be a human being means that compassionate humility courage and everything else that goes with it to be tenacious are all part of it so learn to be compassionate because if you are compassionate you become a much better human being you have a much better life you also are at more at peace with yourself because you are no longer only seeking you are also giving and giving in life my young friends i know you're all very young i can say this with the years of wisdom and the years of experience that i've got giving is far more pleasurable than taking and that you will realize as you go on in your life next slide please don't think that two years at jaipuria and you're done with education i talked about it when we talked about competence i talk about it again continuous learning there are no bounds to seeking knowledge you have to constantly your generation is a generation that is living in a very different world from the time when i got the opportunity to work your generation is in a in a generation where artificial intelligence where machine learning where digitalization where the frontiers of science and technology have expanded far more than what they are today which means that you have to keep yourself constantly abreast and constantly contemporary which means you have to continuously learn if you don't continuously learn you will not be able to be competitive you will not be able to be contemporary and therefore you will not be useful in the organization or in the business that you are working in and there are no bounds to knowledge it is only your ego the more senior you become the more difficult it becomes to ask questions why because you think that people around you will say are bhai ye kaise itna bada aadmi ho gaya fact of the matter is all of us put together cumulatively on this call probably have less than 100 of 1% of all the knowledge that exists on the universe yes or no that's what it is that's all we know so let's have the humility to understand that we have to constantly learn in order to keep ourselves going so don't allow your ego to come in the way allow your curiosity to propel you because your curiosity will get you to learn and will get you to keep abreast to it will also help you to feel young and in fact to think young you know age is only a number they say today why because you can be abreast of the latest developments by reading by listening by seeing you don't have to be 20 years old you can be 80 years old and still be as contemporary and that's because of continuous learning so learn to continuously absorb knowledge continue to read books your generation unfortunately doesn't like to read books you read your ipads and you you play your video games but learn to read books i think books are the are the human being's best friend they keep you going so keep it going for a long long time next slide please this is something <clears throat> that is always contentious and i i say this because it's always my last slide but look at this young buddhist child this monk he is going to be a monk you see that he is dreaming a dream that is extremely pleasant he is going to be a monk he is not going to be the world's richest man and yet you see the sign of contentment on his face contentment is important in your lives contentment is what keeps you on the ground contentment is what keeps you going not complacency contentment complacency is when you give up and you you are overconfident or you feel that look this is not important i don't need this 
or wrong. It's okay. You are not asking you to be complacent. I'm asking you and requesting you to be content. Because contentment means that you don't envy someone else's success. You're all students today at the Jaipuria Institute. You will all pass out one day. Each one will follow a different path. Some will be great business people. Some will be great entrepreneurs. Some of you will be great executives. Some of you will be great authors. Some of you will be great politicians. Some of you will be great statesmen. Some of you will be less than that. But does that mean that your life is unfulfilled because I did not become what X became? No. If you take envy into your heart, then welcome to the world of three things that are guaranteed to happen to you. Number one, your relationships in life will always be strained. Your children will come, they will show you great grades and you will say, why are you not the number one in the class? Relationship with your parents, with your spouses, with your friends will always be strained because you are put on a mukhota. You're wanting to show them something that you are not. Number two, you are welcome to get a lot of ulcers. You'll get a lot of gastric ulcers. Jal jal ke, jal jal ke, aapka pet jo hai, it will create big issues for you. So welcome to the world of gastric ulcers. Number three, the God will also get quite sick and tired of your existence on the planet and might decide to call you early. So welcome to the world of heart attacks. To be envious, you do not realize one fundamental truth of human beings that everyone has a different road and you do not know what road the other guy is on, what difficulties, what strains, what disappointments, what disasters, what colossal damages the other person faces, you never know. And therefore, be content. If you are content, you will receive. If you are content, you will give. If you are content, you will be at peace with yourself because you answer my young friends your own conscience. You are not answering your teachers. You are not answering society. You are not answering your parents. You are answering yourself. And if you what you do yourself, you are happy about, that is happiness. And that is contentment. Not, not achieving or achieving someone else's goal. That is not your contentment. That could be their contentment, not yours. So keep contentment as part of your principle. So these are really the 10 C's that I wanted to share with you. Life's journey, my own life's lessons. Some of these could be of use to you. Some of these could be useless to you. Some of this you may agree, some of this you may disagree. But this is just a viewpoint of a person, a person who's an elderly person as compared to you, who's been through the journey of life and who's probably spent more than half his time on the planet. And therefore, I think I am at least more competent to be able to share this with you. So good luck. God bless you all. Do well in your lives. Adopt as many of these C's as you think is relevant. And may success and contentment always be with you. Thank you very much. And I look forward to questions. Karu, may I request that these screen be unshared now. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Narayan, for a most uh, thought-provoking and a very, very well encapsulated uh, orientation to our um, young students. And when we thought that you'd be speaking to an audience, I had this in mind that I'll make a special request that you share life lessons, but this entire discourse has been woven around those life lessons. I think uh, this would be a life-changing event for at least a few of them. I can be very sure of that. The marketing professor in me is pricking me to ask you some uh, business and marketing related questions, but I'll hold that on for later on. There are students who have their queries here and also a faculty member. I'm picking up one question, which has come from Varsha Keshri, uh, our student. And she says that, um, I remember your statement when your team was trying to handle the Maggie crisis, that uh, fight, not flight. Uh, she requests you to throw more light on that. 
I think it's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> look, this is a this is a matter of of uh, of uh, of the core of a human being, which is your attitude. You can you can you can be confronted with numerous problems. You can be confronted with numerous very difficult situations that you believe uh, looks unmanageable. You have two options in life. You either fight or you run away from it. We took the Maggie issue as something that we will fight. But we will fight not in physical terms. We will not fight in aggressive terms. We will not fight in disrespectful terms. We will not fight in antagonistic terms. But we will fight a principled battle. And that is what I meant when I said fight and not flight. Thank you very much. I'd probably build my... Uh... My own question that I wanted to ask is sequel to this. And uh, so, I mean, uh, Maggie's brand in 2014 was pushed at number uh, five, I think, most trusted brand in the ET brand equity survey. It tumbled a few base, uh, notches after that. And I was reviewing it, 2020 ratings are number 13, if I'm not wrong. And uh, so um, I've been following up your story. And the one thing that stood out, and I, I uh, draw inspiration for what you just said that, is that uh, through it all, whether it was dropping sales, uh, product recalls, eroding customer and stakeholder confidence, uh, the official voice of Nestle uh, poignantly and stoically maintained that Maggie is safe to eat. How tough you think it was holding your ground um, while being responsive to the popular discourse? What do you think was the secret ingredient for the recovery of this brand and for regaining the lost ground? I think uh, it's a very good question. Um, but I think, um, you know, if you look at it, you know, every company has got a core purpose and a core principle that is inviolable. At Nestle, food quality and safety is what we believe is inviolable. So whether you are Switzerland or Germany or Indonesia or Philippines or India or China, the quality and food safety of every single pack produced at a Nestle factory is completely and totally inviolable in terms of the quality that it is able to deliver. That is what is our promise and that's what we do and that's what in, is there in our DNA. So when I said that the product is safe, I said it because my backbone was strong. If I was speaking from a company where quality standards can be, can be differential or where, where the standards can keep changing uh, day in and day out, I would not have had the strength to say that. But I said it and I stood by that conviction. And in fact, when the testing was done, post the, the, the Mumbai High Court judgment, every single sample cleared the, the test. And these are all random samples, nothing that you, know, you, could, you could send particular samples. Every single sample uh, cleared it. And if even one sample out of a thousand samples had failed, you as a consumer would have been entitled to say, I don't think this product is safe. That wasn't the case. So I think we had the courage, we had the conviction because we knew that we will not do anything wrong as far as food quality and safety is concerned. And I think that's the reason uh, why we said what we said. And number two, uh, I think I credit the comeback of Maggie and it came back to leadership within, within three months, despite being off the market. You know, it is the only brand in marketing history in India, which was clinically dead for six months yeah. and which came back to leadership uh, within three months. And I think I... I, I really credit it to our consumers. And I'm, I'm sure that the more than 500 people who are on the call today are all consumers of, of, of Maggie. It is because of the love and trust of the consumers of Maggie. Because even the, when the world was shouting about Maggie, you didn't believe a word. You didn't believe a word because you chose to love this brand because this brand has only given you happy, memorable moments. Even today, it is ironic, um, uh, Dr. Patak, that... Uh, the brand that was vilified five years ago was the most sought after brand uh, when the pandemic started. People were stocking up on Maggie as if it is going to go out of uh, fashion, right? And uh, why does that happen? It happens because you love a brand, you trust a brand, and you, and, and you believe that this brand uh, is there for you. So in every sense, while a lot of you give me credit for doing whatever uh, the company did, 
I think it, the, the credit is to the consumer because the consumer trusted it and the consumer still trusts it. And that's why it is where it is. That's uh, extremely very, very well answered, sir. I have the next question coming from Mohammed Sayed, who's quoting another luminary of the corporate world and not name, but he's saying that uh, we frequently advise to be humble in our pursuits in corporate world. But uh, he says, I know it is difficult to be humble every time because people say you are a fool. How can uh, one balance it out, be humble and not be perceived as a fool at the same time? Look, I think there is a difference between humility and 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 uh, and uh, being uh, being a fool, right? And I think as there is an old proverb that says that uh, he who knows not and knows not that he knows not is a child, teach him. He who knows and knows that he knows is a wise man, follow him. And he who knows not and knows not that he knows not is a fool, shun him, shun. right? So I think, I think we have to be very clear in life that humility is a virtue. Humility is a sign of extreme strength. It is not a sign of weakness. A person who is humble can only be humble if he has got inner strength, the conviction, the wisdom, the knowledge, the confidence, and the competence to do what he is expected to do. But he doesn't shout himself out. You know, it is important in, in life to remember that humility is a virtue because humility gives you two things. Humility, number one, makes you accessible. So everybody around you is capable of coming and talking to you and sharing their problems. If you are an arrogant person, nobody will come and talk to you because they're all scared. And number two, humility, as the Dalai Lama once said, it helps you because it helps you to listen. By listening, you listen to what you do not know. By speaking, you repeat what you already know. And there is a big difference. So I don't think that humility is seen together with being a fool. Humility is a sign of strength. People around you may think in this hyper-competitive age that you have to shout and scream in order to do whatever you have to do. But if your characteristic is to be humble, continue to be humble. Because that's the way in which you will find success coming to you. And humble people also attract a lot of attention. You don't have to keep shouting. Humble people in their own way get attention when attention is needed. Thanks, sir. That's, I think, a very powerful summarization of uh, this particular point when you say that when you listen, uh, you learn, and when you speak, you repeat what you already know. Very, very powerful thought. I think the students can reflect or the audience can reflect on it later. I take the next question uh, coming from Professor Sushma Vishnani, who's a professor in the finance area with us. She says, um, do you believe vulnerability adds to the effectiveness of leadership? Although our society has been hardly showing any softer attitude for any person's vulnerability, people are busy showing just the be best part of them. Uh, that's how we are conditioned now. So any reflections? I think, it's a, I think it's a very, very, uh, it's a very, very powerful uh, thought. Uh, I, I personally believe that, you know, whether you call it vulnerability or not, um, I think we have forgotten today to be just human. We have got mukhotas in everything. We have got we 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 put on uh, we put on so many layers of who we are not that we have forgotten who we are, and that is a tragedy. So I think vulnerability is is definitely important. I mean, when you are leading a team, and especially at this time of of, of a crisis. In fact, for your team, you're the only person that they look up to because they don't know what's going to happen in the pandemic. They don't know what's going to happen to the world. They don't, they don't know what's going to happen to their organization. They don't know whether they have their jobs, whether they have the money to support their families. They don't know any of these things. Whom do they go to? They either go to God, right? And that is prayer. Or they come to the leader. And if the leader pretends that he is a, a Mahabali, who knows everything about everything, uh, then you become less credible as a leader. So a leader must be capable of asking the right questions, but not of knowing all the answers. And a leader must show the vulnerability because to be vulnerable is to be human. And when you are two humans talking to each other, even if you are more senior, more experienced and the, and the, and the, and the larger person in the organization, but you are still human. 
and i think vulnerability therefore us it also engenders and fosters uh, uh, teamwork and it also helps together finding a solution rather than pretending that you have the solution thank you sir that again is a very very powerful uh, interpretation of the question uh, now the question is from apurva singh who is asking what are your thoughts on a leader being curious you think curiosity helps leaders in learning growing and making better decisions yes i think i think i think curiosity is very important uh, you know more more often than not you know there are always biases that come into um, into decision making uh, one is one of them is called a confirmation bias which means that you always uh, tend to take a decision that you think or you tend to uh, to look at data uh, to support the decision that you want so you work backwards decision taken you work backwards to what the data should be showing you uh, so i think it is important to be curious because curiousness does two things for you number one it is capable of getting new points of view on the table uh, which is important and number two is uh, that uh, if you know more about a subject then you are able to take a more informed decision uh, on something rather than just taking it on the feeling uh, on the, on on a basis of gut feel or indeed on on the spur of the moment or indeed because of confirmation bias so uh yeah confirmation bias incidentally is on doing of a lot of leaders were lower and uh, y- yes men all around probably make it even worse so i think to um, the series of questions the next one's coming from anil kumar and uh, he is a very curious question to ask he says uh, dear sir uh, how to cope with the current situation when every organization wants to make people multitasking and multidimensional also that is leading to double speak in the organization and chaos all over and uh, mental calmness is going for a toss uh, how do you interpret it look i think i think this pandemic uh, i've said this uh, i've said this before and and i i maintain this in 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 in, in, in all humility uh, i think in a in a crisis uh, of this kind uh, you don't run a company but you serve a family so a leader must look at this as an opportunity to serve a family Uh, rather than to run a company uh, running a company involves process matrices decision making resources and outcomes running a family involves emotions guidance support compassion and outcomes that might or might not be certain but it gives the human being a lot of 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 succor and it gives the human being a lot of comfort so i think at this stage at least what i have tried to practice to the best of my ability and maybe i have gone wrong in 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 some of this i do admit as a human being but i have always put uh, people and partnerships and purpose before profit uh, because i think if you have focused on your people on the safety and security of your people on the safety and security of your partners of the vulnerable people who work for the organization who support the organization and if you are uh, solely looking at the purpose and values of your organization uh, you are able to sustain yourself and in fact uh, the business also carries on of course i am also uh, to be honest uh, dr patak i am i am also blessed to be in an organization uh, where the business is still uh, is still going on and uh, i'm not as badly affected as some of the other sectors like uh, airlines or, or or travel and tourism or hotels or any of those uh, so I, i i can feel their pain it must be a very very painful uh, decision making process and existence there but at least uh, in so far as my organization is concerned uh, we do try and address uh, issues around stress uh, managing uh, work life balances uh we 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 keep having uh, almost every week uh mental health workshops and wellness workshops uh, because we have a lot of young people you know 80% of of nestle india are uh, millennials uh, so when i retire the average age will fall by 5 uh, definitely uh, so it is it is i think uh, it's important to address uh, the mental well being issues of people uh, and to address their overall comfort and safety Uh, before you address uh, the profits and and the consequential uh, uh, sustainability of the business model 
uh, thanks, uh, thanks. That um, leads me to ask a question that I listed out. Simple one, but I think anecdotally or um, recollecting from your own experience, uh, all of your interviews of the time of the crisis, um, one thing prominently jumps out is a statement that you just said that um, you put people before um, everything else. And um, and you also said that uh, I asked myself two questions uh, when I was given the charge of Nestle India in 2015 to Dow Sophia. Why me? And then, you know, I thought about it. I looked at that as a um, trust placed on my abilities to handle the crisis. At the same time, you said the mounting uh, issue of keeping the faith and restoring the confidence of uh, uh, stakeholders and primarily the consumers and employees uh, is what you saw as the agenda number one. Uh, if there are certain lessons or there's some segment of the story that you'd like to share with us on that, that could be very, very powerful. I think, I think, I think it, was, uh, it is, um, it is about both, these, both these to me are important. Uh, number one is yes. Uh, sometimes when you are uh, when you are put into a difficult spot, you wonder why me. Uh, but I, I keep telling young people this, and I would like to say this today as well: that adversity is the best teacher. Uh, you will never learn in good times as much as you learn in bad times. So when you are going through these bad times of the pandemic, uh, try and learn as much as you can because adversity will teach you. It will teach you about yourself. It will teach you about society. It will teach you about organizations. It will teach you about institutions, about 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 uh, about uh, pe people and leaders and perspectives. So I think you will you will learn a lot. So I, I I honestly believe that adversity therefore has taught me a lot. And uh, secondly, I think uh, you know in this world where perception is reality, uh, it is important to ensure that if your reality is 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 something different. Uh, that you that you share the the the, the perception of it appropriately. Uh, we knew that as a company we had done no wrong. Uh, we knew that we were we were marketing and selling and uh, and and manufacturing the safest of products, uh, the best quality of products. Uh, but we also knew that we have to keep repeating this this statement uh, with all humility and with all uh, with with uh, with with all courage. Uh, and with all the confidence, uh, because that's the only way out. I mean, there's no point in getting angry and getting uh, getting frustrated, uh, but you have to keep repeating it and repeating it well and repeating it with a lot of conviction, because only then will the will the will the will the tide uh, change, as it did for us. Uh, there are uh, very many questions popping up. I'm trying to find one that I had identified here. Just give me a minute, I'll come to it. Um, I think perhaps he was asking about what you said that has inspired us big time, but, uh, and you probably will be acting as a role model for us. This uh, Priyanshi is asking that question. So the question she's asking is, uh, has there been a role model in your life who inspired you to uh, set course of your career and to take the decisions or to resolve decision dilemmas? Look, uh, I want to sort of maybe Priyansh will find it very disappointing because you know most people mention uh, big names like uh, like uh, Bill Gates or Narayana Murthy or Steve Jobs or people as as, as inspirations. Uh, I I honestly uh, you know I they are all great people so it's not that I don't get inspired by by great people and by by people who have achieved a lot. Uh, but I've been influenced more I must say by my maternal grandmother my nani has been the one who has influenced me. And uh, she was a, a, a five feet nothing, um, you know, eight standard educated woman, uh, but of enormous strength, enormous conviction, uh, a lot of courage and uh, with terrific people skills. And I think she always, uh, this, this warmth and feeling towards people and towards relationships uh, and my values, uh, I am eternally grateful to my parents for giving me the values and uh, to my nani for uh, practicing it in my life. And uh, uh, that has been a source of great inspiration. So for me, it is, it is my immediate family that has been my inspiration rather than any great uh, business leader. I probably not want to interpret that any further, but I think the way you speak and the way people figure on top of the priority list for you as a leader, maybe some of the grand maternal element is rubbed on to how you have shaped up as a leader, which I think has been a wonderful influence. Um, 
we've been talking and the couple of questions i can't pick them up individually who are uh, built around the current crisis and uh, when I um, hear you speak in past or when I see the discourse of your progression through your career, crisis has been an inbuilt and strong element of uh, uh, your progression or the way you have built the elements of credibility uh, and a track record of uh, being the person to go to in the event of crisis springing up. And um, as a once again, as a student and teacher of uh, marketing, I read this statement, which I read uh, coming from you. It said that the crisis will lead to recalibration of the consumer wallet among economic disruption and uh, stating that consumer preferences will shift towards brands that are tried and tr trusted. And even when we look at the annual reports of the company, the one word that jumps upfront, apart from sustainability is trust. So um, how do you view consumer trust um, you know, and in sailing through the current crisis and what will be of a sense for people as well as for brands to sail through the crisis? I think, I think, I think trust is, um, as you know very well, you know, uh, trust is, takes decades to build and seconds to lose. So, and it, it is as important of human relationships as it is of uh, corporates. So I think if, uh, as, a, as, a, as the world's largest uh, food, beverage and nutrition company, uh, if we have been surviving for 155 years and, uh, and doing well as a company, it is because of the single word trust. Uh, trust means a lot of actions, whether it is in procurement or quality or technical or marketing or whatever, uh, but trust is the bottom line. And for us, I believe that uh, in this pandemic, uh, the reason why uh, we, get, we get picked up by the consumer is because of the word uh, trust. Uh, consumers feel that this is a company that I can trust. Uh, my uh, my partners feel that this is a company that uh, that we can trust. To just give you an example, we we work with 100,000 uh, farmers in Punjab. You know, one lakh farmers uh, have been giving us milk since 1961. So we have now spent 60 years collecting milk from these farmers, and almost 78,000 out of the 100,000 farmers are female farmers. So long before diversity became a big boardroom uh, topic, uh, Nestle was practicing uh, this in the, in the farms. Uh, and when the pandemic started, the first worry that most farmers had was, will Nestle pick up milk? What will we do with all the milk? And you know, you've read stories where across the country, people have thrown milk on the streets. Uh, but we took every single drop of milk. We said whether what we do with it is our problem but we will collect every single drop of milk because this is the word trust. They have trusted you for 60 years and you cannot let that trust to pass. We've done this with, with about 10% of our uh, suppliers are MSMEs and a very small uh, people with three people and four people employment. We ensured that they got their orders on time. We ensured that they got their payments on time. We ensured that they got advance payments wherever they needed to get it. We ensured that they got the permissions to start because when the lockdown happened, there was a, a lot of problem getting permissions. We ensured that our people trained them on hygiene, social distancing, masking, uh, thermal checking, et cetera, et cetera, because we have exacting standards. We help them with the standards. I think this is the time when corporates must realize that you are like the banyan tree. And like a banyan tree, you have to protect uh, the beings that are, that are uh, uh, standing in the shade under you. And that is the role and that is the rule that we have kept for ourselves. And all this is important uh, when you deal with, 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 with uh, consumers. So trust in every sense. And because our brands are, are old and trustworthy, I mean, uh, brands like Milkmaid are 156 years old, you know, or Nescafe or, or KitKat or Munch or Maggie. Uh, these are very trusted, uh, trusted old brands. And when, uh, when in difficulty, like what human beings do. When you are in a difficult situation, you go and talk to your parents or to your spouse or to somebody you trust. It's the same happening on the consumer side. That when there is a, a sudden shock, you go back to the brands that you are used to and that you trust. That's, thank you for that. And uh, another question, the multiple coming up in the chat box, but I would just use last one from my side. I was... Uh, 
uh, I think post the Maggie crisis, there would be have been multiple case studies and empirical investigations. I was reading this particular empirical story by a uni University of Illinois researcher based out of India. And uh, she looked at the consumer segments that emerge in terms of sentiment analysis uh, for Maggie as a brand. And she divides them into three brackets. Uh, predominantly a large chunk of Maggie customers, thankfully she calls them as uh, devotees. They would be with the brand no matter what. Then doubters who would be middle of the path, you know, they could go this way and that. And a small insignificant chunk is what uh, is called as dropouts. And, uh, you know, she, she probably uh, proposes that there could be three different approaches to corporate communication to redeem the lost crown. But somewhere in your interviews, I read that you're more concerned about people who are devoted to the brand and uh, probably wasting too much of energy on the detractors um, could be distracting. So I don't know. That's what I read. I, 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 the way I look at it um, yeah. is that uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I won't use the word waste uh, time on, on these people. But the fact of the matter is, the way the crisis happened, the way it was played out, um, it is absolutely plausible, and it is absolutely possible that some consumers got completely switched off the brand, and uh, it is a tragedy. It is a tragedy for us as as Nestle, the company. Uh, but this is the fallout of a crisis that is full blown and uh, that uh, that harmed our reputation. So uh, the way I look at it is that uh, the brand was strong enough <clears throat> to bounce back because of the loyalists and because of some of the doubters who uh, go in and out. Uh, but yes, uh, the collateral damage of, of a huge crisis of this kind will be a certain segment of people who will say never again noodles or never again Maggie. Uh, as a case may be. Uh, we accept it in all humility and we do hope that uh, the actions that we have done in the last five years and, and going beyond uh, will gradually give them the confidence to come back to us. But like I said, trust takes time to build with all uh, consumers. It will take its own time and I'm, 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 I'm hopeful that someday uh, they might see merit in, uh, in, uh, in coming back to their favorite brand. Yet again, because the equity for the brand is so strong, so strong uh, that it is difficult to uh, difficult to to break those bonds very easily. So the Miss You Maggie campaign or Mary Wally Maggie campaign, uh, those those were I think some brilliant concepts that came from the fold. And uh, so I'm mixing two questions here. There's one from Anushree Bhagatu saying, going back to your advisory around built around the twelve C's. Um, She's asking here, what is right for me could not be right for others. Uh, how do we make sure that we have everyone on board and find a middle ground? I'm mixing with it the question from Kritik Kumar, Kartik Kumar Tiwari, who says, sometimes we are stuck between ethical and humanitarian ground uh, while taking decisions. So ethical and moral dilemma on one side and onboarding uh, different perspectives and different value systems and finding a middle ground. So these are the two questions that I'm trying to merge into one. I think, I think, I think you know, my first, my first advice would be you are living, you are living your life. You answer your conscience, and therefore there is no question of looking at middle grounds and 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 trying to find a grand average for whatever you're seeking to achieve. It's your life, your conscience, your goal, your time, your passion, your energy, your hard work. So do the things that you believe you are comfortable with. And I think that is a very important part of, 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 of life's journey, rather than trying to satisfy everybody. But unfortunately, we have seen those who try and keep everyone happy are themselves unhappy because nobody is happy with them and they are also not happy with themselves. Secondly, as far as uh, ethical and moral issues are concerned, all of us are born and are raised with a certain moral compass. This moral compass is your greatest coverage in life. This is the one thing that will stand by you when everything else falls. Your friends will leave you, your family will leave you, your society will leave you, but your conscience and your moral conscience will never leave you. So my only advice is do what you think your moral conscience tells you to do, because it's very easy to fall into the trap and those who are doing unethical acts uh, and are intrinsically ethical people, you will not, you cannot, even eat the next meal because your conscience will hurt you like hell. 
saying maine kya kiya why have i gone and done this because this hurts me so if you are a serial offender no problem you can go ahead and do whatever you feel like because obviously it doesn't hurt you anymore but if you are an ethical honest conscience conscientious person and you do something very unethical then obviously it is going to hurt you so don't allow that hurt because that can damage you for forever so can we have the last question uh, uh, yes, i thought uh, maybe just two and then wind it okay. up if that's okay for yeah, me sure, right. sure. so um this time i'm i'm uh, mixing your anecdote on a snap deal uh, a uh, posture that the company had taken with the feedback from a young employee and this is a question or a, maybe a point made by jatin atiyani who says that sir how is nestle increasingly interacting with its customers quoting a particular example he says uh, one customer miss maggie in the pandemic and posted on social media tagging nestle and next day morning the maggie goodies were delivered at his doorstep surprising him so um the new age millennials like you said the power of millennials in the workforce and that's what our own students are going to be if they join nestle using and leveraging what they have to further the leadership vision uh, how do you view this look i think you know uh, for me honestly i i say this in in, in all sincerity uh, i think too much is being made out about this fickle mindedness or the uh, or the the kind of insecurities that are felt by millennials i think this is you know to me it's completely i think it's a it's it's a, it's a it's a it's a false uh, hypothesis uh, what is it that a millennial is seeking that is different from a person like me i think there's very little when i started my job i wanted to be in a company which gives me a decent career a decent salary decent responsibilities Uh, a decent uh, a, a decent respectability and uh, some recognition for the contributions that i made as a uh, as a professional and as a human being what is it that a millennial looks at today it's all the same and yes the millennial today is more ethically and societally conscious of the place that he wants to work in because there are numerous options you know in my time there were few options so you went and worked in those few options and if they happen to be good companies like i was blessed to start at hindustan lever which is a which is a, 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 a top class company so I, i i didn't have any any such moral issues so i think you know it is possible for you and, and that is the task of leadership uh, to create the bedrock and to create the environment uh, where uh, ethical honest purposeful value based a uh, professional and competent work gets recognized and gets promoted over a period of time so uh, you know i am i told you my my company is 80% uh, millennial uh, uh, my attrition rate is 3% 3% oh, amazing so it's, it's outstanding it's millennials, 80% millennials and 3% attrition right even in the worst time of the of the uh, in the last 5 years we had a 5% attrition Five to six percent is about the maximum that we uh, that we that we lost, and uh, these are the the people that we regret uh, having uh, having lost them. So, I think you know, uh, youngsters today, uh, they work in organizations that have got a strong set of purpose and values, where ethical standards are high. You know, um, in, in in Nestle today, about seventy five percent of my management trainees are women. Uh, about seventy percent of my sales trainees are women. About fifty-five percent of my technical trainees are women. Uh, we are becoming a more uh, a diverse company. Almost a fifth of the frontline sales force of the company are women, and we have the highest proportion of women in the sales force of any FMCG in this country. And I'm very proud of it. So these young women professionals are working extremely well. Uh, they find the environment uh, honest ethical uh, respectful uh, and and we are very very conscious about it uh, in some sense we are a little bit of an old fashioned company when it comes to behaviors and the kind of standards of behaviors uh, but yes we are very happy with, uh, with the fact that millennials are interacting with uh, with uh, generation x and with baby boomers and uh, still having a a a good career and still enjoying their uh, their jobs with the with the company and that's a very powerful statement coming from you sir that the millennials
You're muted. Last question I'll take from a gentleman who probably is um, representative of a student cohort that doesn't go into a job profile. So they choose to be entrepreneurs. And this is uh, maybe, uh, this is from uh, Mr. Singh, Reddy Singh, as I can read it. He's asking with someone uh, having a business idea and looking for capital, um, what would be your suggestions? What point to keep in mind to get the right kind of interest aroused from investors? Look, I think firstly, um, uh, number one is you have to be convinced and passionate about the business idea that you've got. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, don't be an entrepreneur for the sake of being an entrepreneur. Be an entrepreneur if you really believe that you've got an idea that burns you, an idea that fires your imagination, an idea that is capable of uh, sustaining and giving value in whatever uh, sphere it, it is talking about. Number one, that's very, very important. Uh, number two is uh, on your journey, it is more important how the journey is undertaken rather than the end destination. I think all of you, and some of you at least certainly look at valuations. You know, we get our uh, we get our, 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 our seed funding and then we get our series A and then we get our series B and then we look at valuations and then we say, am I a, am I a unicorn? Am I a small unicorn, big unicorn? I think that becomes more important. My only suggestion to you in all humility is please don't worry about that. Worry about the journey. Worry about how you make your first sale. How do you continue to make more sales? What kind of people do you get? What kind of corporate culture and what kind of work culture are you setting uh, in your organization? And use that as a, as, a, as a metric for how successful you are. And number three is uh, think failure every day. Because if you think failure every day, you will find the seeds of success. If you succeed at first shot, something is too good to be true. You will have to take your falls so take your falls and learn from it and move on. So my only suggestion is, is these two or three things. And uh, good luck to you. And it's most beautifully unpacked. The last request we usually make is uh, any reads that you'd like to recommend to the young audience here, uh, which make uh, you've been, you know, you'll recommend as going forward will help them in their life and career. Well, uh, there are there are quite a few uh, there are quite a few um, uh, books that um, that you know I I, I mean. Uh, I must say that one book that, is, that has influenced me a lot is uh, maybe slightly dated, but it's still a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a interesting uh, uh, book by John Cotter. Uh, My iceberg is melting. Uh, so uh, I think it's a, it's a book on, on, on leadership, conviction, on convincing uh, people uh, around you. Uh, it's an interesting book. One more is called Ikigai, which is... Uh, uh, which is uh, also a, a, a lovely book on seeking purpose and uh, seeking, uh, seeking values in life uh, from, a, from a Japanese perspective, but it's, it's equally applicable to, to all of us. Uh, this, could be, this could be one or two books that I would, I would, I would recommend to my, young, uh, uh, to my young audience. And the one word that I think I, I was just closing with that statement is uh, resilience, which I think... Uh, uh, has reflected itself very well in, in your discourse previously. And I remember having speaking about the pandemic and upskilling yourself in doing dishes two times a day at home while in confinement yes. that, that I found very interesting. And that I think in a lighter way in trying to uh, connect it with the need to continue. No, I, think, I think it's important. Uh, it's important. You know, we, we sometimes follow a path where we, uh, we, we get very self-opinionated. And uh, we get, uh, we, we balloon the true perspective and nature of our jobs. And we forget that, uh, you know, we are human beings and that we have to have our feet on the ground. Uh, so I, I like to, I like to do this. When I go out, I, you know, I like to eat in a daba. I don't want to necessarily go to a five-star hotel. I like to eat at a simple place. Uh, that, it keeps me connected uh, to the reality that I prefer rather than the reality that I aspire to. So I think I'd uh, probably, uh, with that, we close the questions. And so I thank you enormously on behalf of all of the audiences here, the institution, our management. Uh, I take pride in presenting to you, sir, that should have been done in the beginning. I'm doing it in the end, having listened to your wonderful and beautiful discourse. We have uh, 
in terms of environment sustainability, made a baby step in adopting green certificates as a replacement of bouquets. So we uh, dedicate this green certificate to you, sir. And a tree will be planted in your name in the Sundarban National Park, West Bengal, uh, which is GIS marked and can be tracked. Email identification of this will reach you. We are proud uh, today and it's been a privilege. And I have also been given to understand that perhaps you have completed your decade of uh, work life with Nestle today is it right information, sir, or not so right? No, I, no, I think I think you know the LinkedIn always uh, looks at the last milestone. Yeah. I have completed I think ten years of being a chairman of uh, of uh, companies of in Nestle. In the current role, yes. and in, in in the role in in North Africa and the role in Philippines and the role in India. So I completed ten years of being a chairman. I am close to forty years of work experience and about twenty years. Uh, plus in Nestle. So I had thought so because I got the input. I, no, no, I had no, thought ten, so. Ten years, so. I was in a bit of a doubt in asking is, you. It's too good to be true. I can't be talking <laughs> about, uh, I can't tell my youngsters here to follow a, a dhire dhire semana path uh, if I made it to, uh, to to a chairman in 10 years flat and, and continue to be one. So I think, I think you know, it was 10 years of being a chairman of a company. Yes. So, uh, uh, in that, uh, on that note, sir, thank you for joining us today. And the powerful lessons that you've shared, we'll make sure that we take uh, these lessons to the students back again and reflect on them time and again. It'll be a pleasure and honor to host you in the future. We can do that. Meanwhile, uh, our best wishes for the journey going forward. And thank it's you. going to be a roller coaster ride for all of us, but I think not so much for the FMCG sector. So, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you, you, everyone, thank you. and good, good evening. Uh, God bless and, and all the